The one pop artist whose work seemed to embrace consumerism was Andy Warhol. He took America's most familiar mass-produced objects and re-presented them as art, an art of numb repetition that mimicked the production line. His critics accused him of selling out, but they didn't get the true starkness of his message. There's a common misconception about Andy Warhol, the idea that he was a mere gimmick monger, a trickster, on the New York art scene, a man purely obsessed by celebrity, status and money. But it's not true. Andy Warhol was, for my money, the single most significant American artist of the second half of the 20th century, a great philosopher, describer, a man who really understood what it was that made this new post-war American civilization unlike any other civilization that had preceded it. And in this world, there's variety, but only of a certain kind. That's the subject of this. One of his earliest series of pictures. I think it's one of his greatest series of pictures. It's the Campbell's Soup Tins. We begin with tomato soup, vegetable soup, green pea soup. We come all the way through to bean with bacon soup, cream of chicken soup, turkey noodle, minestrone Italian style vegetable soup. New, great as a sauce too, cheddar cheese soup. You can have all this. But then again, everyone else can have all this too. It's variety, but it's also a trap. And I love the way that the paintings are laid out almost as if they're lining a cell that you can pace, but you can't ever escape from. I think this is Warhol's way of saying, this is your world, America. This is the prison you've made for yourself. To help him generate his mass-produced art, Warhol surrounded himself with a group of free spirits in the factory, his aptly named Manhattan studio. It was the hip hangout for bohemians, speed freaks, anyone hoping to attain Warhol's 15 minutes of fame. One of the factory's stalwarts was photographer Billy Name, who started out as Warhol's lover, but quickly became the visual chronicler of the factory scene. 45 years on, Billy lives in the town of Poughkeepsie in upstate New York. These are actually silkscreen prints of uh, some of my photographs. Here's Andy on the telephone. Now, what's more important than Andy on the telephone? <laughs> in the early years especially, he was always on the telephone. You, um, you really were the original fly on the wall then. I mean, in the sense that you were so ever-present that, that people just stopped seeing you. They stopped seeing you. So yes, you could they just did. record what was I going on. I just could live there, be there, and no one would even pay any attention to me. And I did know Andy from the time he was a commercial artist through the transition period to when he was a celebrated fine artist. So I went through that whole period with him. So I've known all the changes and all the Andes and... Uh... <laughs> all the Andes, I like <laughs> yeah. it. If you wanted to explain to somebody who'd never heard of Andy Warhol, you know, who never, who never knew who this guy was, you know, what would you say the point of those Brillo boxes and those Del Monte boxes, you know, remade and presented as works of art? What was he trying to say or what were you all trying to communicate with this? Well, what we were trying to say was that you live in art. You go to the supermarket and you go down the rows of cans and they're all just stacks and stacks of icons on, on your shelves and you're living in art. And Andy was fascinated with the lucidity of repetition, the, the absolute clarity of what, what you can see because in a supermarket they really want you to see what's there. And so we produce these boxes like the Brillo box in a numerous occasion, so you saw what was there and you could not escape the Brillo box and the reality of it. I think of him as, I think of him as almost like a mirror. I think of his art like a mirror. Yes. It's like, look at it, this is your world. I'm mirroring it back to you. Yes, yes. The older artists are considered uh, the artist as a hero, whereas when Andy came, he was the artist as a zero. The previous generation had been, turn your back on the surface culture. Yeah. You don't want to deal with that. It's cheap. 
it's shallow, and don't go into that water. Whereas Warhol would say, instead of turning our back on it, let's just turn around, face it, and take it over and manipulate it. Warhol saw that America treated celebrities just as it treated products, as objects replicated for mass consumption. A single image screen printed over and over evokes a row of magazine covers, the frames of a film, a stack of TV screens. But Warhol's most powerful work is his death and disaster series begun in 1962. Race riots, atomic bombs, electric chairs, car crashes, all are made from actual press photographs in America even death is reproduced and homogenized. I think what Warhol was driving at in those pictures was the way in which the big media, television and the newspapers, were desensitizing Americans by exposing them continually to horrific images, whether of war or of car crashes. Warhol said, in relation to the car crash paintings, when you see a gruesome image once, it shocks you. When you see it again and again and again, you stop thinking about it. It stops bothering you. And I think he felt that something strange and bizarre and unpleasant was happening to the American psyche. He felt that Americans were being desensitized. Perhaps his darkest statement of all was simply when he said, I think in the 1960s, Americans forgot what emotions were supposed to be. And I don't think they've ever remembered. Warhol had portrayed the car as just another of America's morbid machines mass-producing road crash deaths for tabloid readers to gawk at. 